now talking about the impact of current government policy on people's lives at a, at a, at a very, very basic level. And I think in our communities we can see that with those cards. So um, if you could just indicate if you want to come in with either a question or a comment from Francis, I'll take Joe first, and then if you could just raise your hands if you want to, if you want to come in. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Councillor. Welcome to Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I'm here. <laughs> 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 no, I just wonder if you would elaborate on the difference between the Welsh Foundation and particularly in fact to hear that you are coming with a programme to Nathan. Just a little bit more information on that because Sinead and I So what has happened um, from, from the programme point of view, for years and years and years we couldn't get funding, um, but more recently um, we, we partnered up with another great organisation who does get funded uh, by the government, uh, not an awful lot but they still get funded, um, and they're called the Family Support Network. So the Family Support Network are a great organisation. What they do is they provide peer-to-peer -peer support for family members who have somebody that has a, an al a problem with alcohol or drugs. And, um, but again, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, and I just thought, wouldn't it be great? From, from my perspective, I wanted to set up an organisation where there was you know, highly qualified therapists who would deliver an educational programme as well as a therapeutic programme. So I thought it would be great for us to partner up with the Family Support Network. <laughs> so thankfully we did that in Dundalk. And working, uh, we, we partnered up with Dundalk um, Family Support Network and a, an addiction service in Dundalk called Taurus and then the Rise Foundation. So we, we, we put up the terms of reference and all of that and then we went looking for funding and we did get funding. We got funding to run our Rise program in Dundalk and it, we did a pilot program and it went really well. So much so that they're now willing to fund um, a program uh, here in Nava. Now, uh, the Family Support Network will refer to us, so, um, but not, in saying that, you can still refer people through to our own office. So, um, we have a website called the Rise Foundation website, and all we ask is for people to set up, um, to go into the website and fill out the inquiry form. Not the contact form, it's a bit complicated, it's the inquiry form and then once they, they contact us, one of our therapists will ring them and uh, we will get back to them and then see if they're able to do the programme. Some people are very vulnerable, so they may not be able to come into a group situation, they might not be ready, so we might have to get them to come in and see us from a one-to-one -one point of view until we get them to a, a stronger place where they can go in and do the, the 10 week family programme. So I hope that answers your question, John. Anybody else with any questions? Um, thank you for coming along today, first of all. It's been really informative. Um, I suppose just following on from what Joe said, um, with regards to resources and, and, and supports that we need on the ground, um, you were talking there about obviously the, the homeless crisis. And what we're finding is that sometimes addiction and homelessness, they're, they're intertwined an awful lot of the time. And you can have like an, a, a revolving door, basically, of somebody who's trying to seek help with dealing with addictions and you put them into emergency accommodation, but they haven't got the help, so they don't keep up their payments and they're thrown out of emergency accommodation. And then they're back in again and we ring up emergency accommodation and in the meanwhile they haven't got addiction counselling and, and it goes round and round. Uh, and, and I know that Caroline there beside you, she, she's working on a... a proposal for the, the step down the housing program and I just want your take on it because you're you're up there um, where decisions are being made and does that get frustrating because it, it gets frustrating to me even just looking at the national 
picture, but I can imagine it's even more frustrating for you, that there seems to be very little joined up thinking with regards to homelessness in the context of even mental health difficulties and addiction. And it seems to me national policy hasn't got its head around the fact that you can't just solve this little bit or work on this little bit. Nothing is in isolation here and we need to look at the bigger picture and you know then then all boats will rise if you get me. So I was just wondering on your yes, thoughts. Yes, I totally agree with you and I think um, yeah, I do get a little bit frustrated around it because like particularly um, the homelessness situation but also the prison the prison situation where you, I worked in Dulcus Women's Prison where we ran a RISE program um, and w w all we asked was uh, for, uh, for women who come from homes where they might have been reared with you know, alcohol or drug misuse. Now a lot of the women might have been in addiction themselves. So they come in and they do the program. Um, the reason I'm saying all this to you is because it is related. They come in and do the program and after they finish the program, they start to really understand why they're in addiction. They understand why they you know, keep going into that kind of revolt. They actually start to find compassion for themselves. Right? So and they realise actually I'm not a bad person. This is just how what happens, you know. And without blaming anybody, you know, because addiction is a very insidious. It's not about blaming anybody. But um, so what what we were trying to highlight is that if you know, and, and this is the problem. And I'm on the Justice and Equality Committee, in in, in, um, in it's the cross party Oireachtas Committee and the prison service were in the other day, and I was talking to them about, you know, I suppose really working on the, the therapeutic uh, addiction services and how important they are. Um, and a lot, of, there's about 70% of people who go in through the prison service who are in addiction. I think it might be a little bit higher because it depends on how you evaluate addiction. Is it, you know, heroin misuse? Is it tablet, tablets are huge now. You know, you have all the benzos, prescription tablets, you know. So um, so my, my belief is, is that if you could maybe educate, this is now, I'm looking for a whole big culture change here, but if you could educate the prison services on the, on the impact of addiction, you know, and then an understanding and having a bit of compassion for those who are in addiction, then to try and, because Merchants Key are amazing, like they're a fantastic, um, service, addiction service, and they do great work. Um, but I believe that more money needs to be pumped into Merchant Key so they can do more work, or Keltoy, uh, because it's a huge problem, it, it's the core. But like that, if they could put money into the services, the addiction services, or even when people come to the courts. I had a woman who came to our, uh, our family program, and really we thought, we all thought, son was a lost cause. We were just waiting. We were all waiting for the phone call. We thought this guy, and he was in and out of prison. Lovely young lad, right? But just when in addiction, just lost the plot. Was in and out of prison all of the time, in and out of prison. And when she started to kind of do this work on herself and, and you know, she kind of stopped trying to fix the problem and she stepped back, he eventually decided, uh, instead of going back into prison, that he wanted to go for treatment, which was brilliant, right? But there was no space available for him. So now we have a, a place where this young lad wants to go in to recovery, but there's nowhere available. And what she did was, the mother did, was she rang Joe Duffy. And within three days, he got a place in. And he's now doing so well. I mean, it's a perfect example. He's now living, like, he, he graduated from Coolmine, like, in January. Um, he's doing really well. Another great organisation, Coolmine. But we need more of them. We need those those services in every community. Do you know what I mean? Because, and I'm not even talking about drugs. I'm talking about alcohol misuse. Because we have a huge, like three people a day die in this country from alcohol misuse. Over 50% of the suicides, <laughs> alcohol plays a role. 1,500 beds in this country are taken up every day, hospital beds, by alcohol misuse. And my belief is, if if the government only could take that on board and look at that and prevent that, they could save themselves. It costs, I think it costs you like a 3.7 billion. This is alcohol alone a year. You know, so I suppose I'm going off and around here, but that's the way I'd be thinking. If only we could look at cultural change and really pumping money into the proper services instead of making fe people feel really bad and putting them into jail and putting them into homes where they're not really, not even home, 
but hostels where they're not really homes, are they? They're not really, you know, they're like just places to stay. They have to leave the first thing in the morning. They're out, of, you know, I mean, it's not living. It's not living, it's existing, mm. you know? So if only we could look at changing all of that, I think, and it is a big cultural change we're looking for. Um, but look, I'm doing my best in there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Francis, thanks for coming. Um, just you mentioned there that young gentleman that has now got his place because his mother called the Joe Duffy show. I think that has been highlighted a lot recently that people are only um, getting access to services that are should be there for them by going through the media, specifically RT. You're talking about Joe Duffy. Uh, the lady who, whose daughter had to go on uh, the Late Late Show last week or the week before uh, to uh, access uh, scoliosis treatment, etc. Uh, that's a massive indictment on, 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 our, on our government, on our society as a whole. It shouldn't have to be like that. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. Um, uh, the other thing then, mental health. The last doll slashed the budget for mental health. Um, addiction, to my opinion, in my opinion, it stems from uh, people using alcohol, heroin, tablets or whatever to deal with something they're not processing in a, in a, a positive mental health way. If there was more funding for mental health, it would come to cut down on addiction. In my mind, I'm not, I don't know the facts and the figures, mm -hmm. but that to me makes sense. Um, like you say, Joined, like Sinead said as well, lack of joined up thinking in this yeah. country and it's our one of our biggest downfalls. That's, yeah. that's it. No, I appreciate it. I, I totally agree with you. I do think that a lot of people who are, you know, using alcohol or drugs or maybe even getting caught up in gambling or whatever yeah. the addiction is, it's a way of numbing out so yeah. they don't have to deal with you know, like what I what we when I was in college it's like I real I learned that addiction is an inability to self soothe. You know, so as a result, then people will use. But if we had proper mental health services, there's, there's, there's a new kind of thing happening now around dual diagnosis. Um, you know, and dual diagnosis is very important. And, you know, I haven't, when I was working in the Rutland as a therapist there, I never met somebody who was just in addiction. Mm. Like, they had issues that they were suffered with depression, anxiety, stress. So the reality is, is that the two of them need to go hand in hand and they need to be dealt with. But what happens is the mental health services don't want to deal with somebody who's in addiction. The addiction services don't want to deal with somebody who has a mental health issue. And that's where it all, but I think that's, we're starting to change. There's a bit of talk about, you know, going on around that now. So hopefully we can change that. Um, thanks very much. Uh, um, I, I think your, your own experience is a very interesting one because uh, I worked as an advisor in Leicester House and one of the things that immediately caught me about the place was that there was, it was populated by a political class, a class of people from certain backgrounds um, that were nearly bred for the place, you know, and in that respect, uh, and there's certain exceptions, of course, Pat or, um, but, uh, <laughs>
its class structure and there are good people in all of those parties but fundamentally at a corporate level if you like they have failed and the proof in the pudding is in the eating um, you can see it in policy so I don't think it's it's any coincidence and we're going back to you know the, the, the writings or you know certainly the actions of Liam Mellows in terms of his identifying of the actual pillars that are there because I think it's it's entirely understandable that the drinks industry would act the way the drinks industry act and you know they are looking after their interests it's entirely logical what's not logical is that a government would be in place that would let its people suffer because of their product you know the drink and, and you know I, I I've listened to different academics speak on the issue and you know you, all you have to do is be a representative for the Sinn Féin party to know the damage that the drink can do to, to communities because we're usually the party that, that you know represents that, 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 that community in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, just to mention, you know, you, you mentioned that the prisons there. I, you know, I would say the community that you grew up in is disproportionately represented in our prison population. The traveller community is disproportionately represented. And that, in my mind, is a product of policy. You know, it's underinvestment in interventions for children, it's underinvestment in education, it's, you know, uh, just, you know, it's, it's not properly taxing those people who, who have wealth. Um, so I, I, I think there are real fundamentals there that, you know, I hope the likes of yourself and a strong Sinn Féin team um, will be in a position to redress some of that. And I think there has been an improvement over the last number of years um, in terms of the discourse and the debate about that. The, the question I really have for you, for you and, and it's touching on a, a point that Caroline made earlier, and I was happy to, to be in a position to vote for you as well. And we, get a, we get a mandate from, from Sinn Féin, and I was hoping and, and, on your ballot that I'd be in a position to, to vote for you, number one, which, which we were in, in me. But, um, you know, you are in a unique position in a lot of respects. You would have a far broader appeal in many respects than, say, a party political person, a person with a, a, a party brand behind them. And I've seen you engage with a number of, of, I would think, progressive voices. And I think of, you know, Lynn Ruan, is it, uh, who is a senator now and, and has a, a very good story herself. But just in terms of your experience in terms of those people in the Oireachtas who share a similar value set to yourself, uh, I, I would hope that everybody in Sinn Féin fall into that category. But you know, those independent voices, those voices within Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael and the Labour Party, you know, what, you know, I, I suppose who are they to a certain extent, but also what's your sense of their strength and, you know, level of cooperation amongst them and that? You know? Well, I do believe, um, I, I'd say particularly in the, in the Senate, um, it's so new what's going on in there uh, because I, I think in, in the old days, you know, I'm not sure, I think everything just got passed, but now I'm in a group in the Shannon called the CEG group, which is called, it's a civil engagement group. So we, we all come from backgrounds of social justice. Um, so there's myself, there's Lynn Ruan, who some of you might know, she's an amazing woman who comes from Tara, unbelievable. Um, you have um, Alice Mary Higgins, another incredibly amazing woman. Um, you know, she, she, she works again, again, social justice and has done particularly around women's issues. Um, you have John Dolan who works very, who's very passionate about disability and, and works very close with those, the vulnerable people who, who he feels there's not enough rights for people with disabilities. Colette Callagher, Colette uh, Callagher, an incredible woman who has worked at the Simon community for many years and is now working in, a, in the field of dementia. She was, um, she was nominated by the Taoiseach. Um, and then you have the amazing Grace O'Sullivan who actually comes from the Green Party, but she's just unbelievable. Like, she's so into social justice. So we're blessed that, you know, and I believe, so in the Shannon, there's six of us. There's another independent group, um, and they're very powerful as well. Um, you have, there's five Labour members, there's seven Sinn Féin people. Um, and in an odd time, we won one or two things, particularly around the CETA motion. Um, and that was Alice Mary Higgins, and she brought that in, and we, we won that motion, which was like, and we were we cheered and clapped and everything. Myself and Lynn, uh, Lynn was, was put in an amendment around for the adoption bill, very interesting thing, and we actually won that amendment. 
So that's all very different. It's so new uh, that that kind of stuff to be happening in there. And you know, I think it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. And we don't know what's going to happen. I, there probably could be an, another election that'll be coming to Joe again at the end of <laughs> September. You know, there could be another election again, you know, um, and very soon, much sooner than we think. So we don't know how it's, what's going to happen. But it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next election because I think people are fed up. I do. Anybody else got any other questions or comments before we move towards closing? Has anybody got any? Yeah. Okay, just again, just to say before I hand over to Padre to close, just to say thank you very much to Francis for, for coming. <laughs>